Hey everyone, welcome to episode two of the Thinking Podcast. I'm your host, Jeffrey Wu. And I'm Michael Brandt. And thanks for tuning in. So our first episode on humans as a system got awesome commentary, feedback, and questions. Keep those uh, coming in and we'll be happy to incorporate and improve and also start doing a more of a back and forth conversation, not just between you and me and other experts that we bring in, but also you guys, the listeners. We're available on SoundCloud, YouTube, and also available on iTunes. So you can subscribe and get weekly updates and episodes from us. So as you know, we're going through the five axioms that drive our thinking behind biohacking and about what, what we're doing at Nutribox period. Yep. So axiom one, humans as a system. Axiom two is intellectual ability is the driving force for civilization today. And the context around that is we believe that intellectual creativity and output drives and will continue to drive all new value creation. Human physical labor will disappear as we enter a new world of automation and robotics. Therefore, tools that enhance intellectual output will be the highest leverage meta tools that's for civilization advancement. So handing it over to you. Yeah. What what you know, when we have this intellectual force as, as a driving force, what does that spark in your it's, mind? It's interesting, right? Intellectual force is intellectual is intellect is the driving force behind civilization today is interesting because it's like, okay, as a, as opposed to what? Like and I think the main thing that it's opposed to is physical force. And when I think about that, I think about the Industrial Revolution, I think about in the past you, could, you might have said the same thing, like, hey, all of a sudden we have machines, we have the ability to make things that, are, that require more force or more speed or more agility than one person can do, or even a team of people, because we have, these, we have industrial heavy machinery that's able to do that. So now what matters is being, in whatever, the 1800s, what matters is being smart increasingly as opposed to just being a strong person. Right. But I think even then, over the last 100 years, and especially more recently, we're seeing... I would say another step function up where there's a reduction in the amount of physical exertion a person has to do and an increase in the amount of that the average person there's more white collar people there's more people who are who do it who are dealing in in intellectual ways as their day-to-day job rather than working on in fields or working in factories so that's yeah. the first, that's what comes to mind yeah i think if you look at uh the big trends of you know, the, the, like how people produce goods, right? Before, you know, it first started off in terms of like very artisan craftsman labor, right? So you had your blacksmith that would pound your horseshoe. Every single horseshoe is a little bit different, a little bit customized for the horse. You know, the sword for the king is a little bit customized, the sword for the knight is a little bit customized, etc. cetera. Um, the, leather, the leather smith had to like carve out each piece of, you know, armor by hand and what enabled like mass production was two things interchangeable parts and specialization right so <clears throat> interchangeable parts meant that hey we have like a defined specification for a piece for example like you know for my rifle you know we need a barrel that's three feet long with two inch diameter one inch diameter right and as long as that you know that that barrel can fit it is to, within a tight enough constraint, we can fit that to any other you know, stock, any other flintlock, any other you know, trigger. And that enables you know, less skill in terms of what the artist needs to be, and you can be sort of starting to be mass produced, right? And this enabled like, you know, Ford with all their cars. Um, it really has like driven you know, production to sort of modern day. Yeah. Where now you have like thousands of people laborers at Foxconn, you know, soldering, you know, the latest camera onto your iPhone 7 right now, and, and it's time for the launch. But, you know, what will the future look like? I think we were talking a little bit about this yesterday, and we posit that the next paradigm shift to totally remove the human intervention in there is fully flexible, multi-use robots. Right. With perhaps the added twist of self-learning and self-optimization yeah i like this idea of flexible robots and it's coming true too because right now i think the fat tail of production is going really well like there for most things 
for the most popular things, there's a machine that does that. Because if you really need something built and you really need to make a million of them, it's totally possible to make a machine, invest $300,000 in a machine that makes this part, that makes this car part, we've this phone part. We've seen that in the Nutribox supply chain. Like we've seen like cost, you know, very single use, like bam, like we're gonna manufacture soft gels, we're gonna manufacture go right. we're gonna manufacture packaging. And, and, you, and there's a large machine that can do that, but what's always interesting is there's, there's always humans there, whether it's at, at Foxconn or at a, a factory that's making Nutribox food factory. or nutraceuticals. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's still people there, and what are the people doing? They're doing stuff like, like you might have a machine that can, that can make very precise supplements and make them like on dose and can make them rapidly uh, in a clean environment, but you still have humans that are there setting it up and you have humans that are there taking it down because a machine hasn't been made to do that yet. You still need something with like a high degree of dexterity or a high degree of on the fly thinking or a high degree of, of some human touch. Like there just hasn't, there aren't enough of those people doing that exact thing where you've designed an exact machine to do that. Again, so it's like long tail, right? The, right. the fat tail, like the main thing that needs to get done is done by machines, but we're, we're figuring out. And I think again, like flexible, robotics like like smart machines that can plug in and can do a, a job like they can do thousands of jobs they can do jobs that the creator of the robot never even thought that this thing should be able to do as right. opposed to now when you make a an industrial machine it does a thing right it stamps out a thing or it makes a mold or it does it's like it cuts a thing it's making something if you ever ever watch these videos on like how stuff is made right how tennis balls are made how whatever like there's every machine has a very specific purpose and it's very calibrated to that one purpose but then filling in the gaps are still humans at foxconn there's still humans and I mean, it's like yeah i think just relating to nutribox personally we've seen like dozens of these factories yeah. Like literally when something goes wrong, we have to hire 20% more laborers to, you know, fix a little small bug in like, you know, the, the die lines or something, right? Like that's literally like what we see in our experience running a physical products company. Right. And um, yeah, I think once we have these like flexible multi-use units, right, then human labor is completely deprecated. I think that's like a pretty exciting future. I think some people. I think that makes some people sad because they're saying, "Hey, you're taking these jobs away from people, and you're giving them the robots." And I think there's. We should talk about that. I think one thing that's that's an interesting counterpoint is that these jobs that people are doing in a Foxconn factory or a lot of factory work that still exists today, I think it's actually depriving the humanity of the workers who have to work there. That. Where if a robot's able to do that, we're giving those people their humanity back. Like they can do something besides like plug the same thing, solder the same thing again and again all day every day. Right. That's not a very human thing. That is a a robotic thing. A human should be doing like beautiful stuff. Should be like creating incredible things, not doing some thing that a robot should be doing. Yeah, I think you know it reminds me of like the coal miners in Pennsylvania, Virginia. It, you know, they're recently in, in the political debate for the U.S. You know, pres. You know, he, you know the November elections, and I, I think there's you know some honor to like, hey, this is a craft that like my family we, we've been the generations of coal miners, and I think there's like some you know sort of like tribal honor of like, hey, that's a you know valuable profession. But I think we should be blunt to say that, hey, like, you know, the, you know, that was like a valuable. Thing that got us from the industrial revolution to the modern you know modern age but like is there true honor of like digging up fossilized you know plant matter from you know 100 you know million years ago i think there's more i think it's more incredible to design the machine that does that right and then can do it a thousand x and can do it better and more precisely without loss of human life like without, is like, like horrible lung, for you yeah without you know yeah aside from like even the climate change stuff like literally like I think it's like a hard argument to truly make that, hey, you know, doing that kind of physical, you know, human muscle power type labor is truly, hey, like, you know, value added, especially when like, you know, we will very soon see like machines, um, you know, be able to do that. I think that also ties into, you know, a sneak peek into Axiom 3, which is hard work, fulfilling work is a means of self-actualization that yeah, we'll yeah. be talking in, in the next episode. Um, I think it's interesting. We think about robots replacing humans, and I think one of the things that that is a conception that a lot of people have about what's going to happen is we think about, hey, robots are going to replace someone working at McDonald's. That when you go to McDonald's in five years, like, there's going to be just like 
a touch screen and it's going to replace like low end like someone can slap a burger together uh, a robot can slap a burger together instead that's great uh, but I actually think it's it's way more incredible than that I, one of the ideas I have that I think there should be restaurants that are high end where the kitchen is entirely run by robots because I don't think robots are like shoddy replacements for humans. I like the idea that a robot can can perfectly keep ingredients in perfect conditions, humidity, temperature, whatever. It can cook it perfectly, perfect cooking time, perfect cooking temperature. Like a master chef, if they're cooking a plate, if they're putting together a plate and there's four different components of the plate, they're timing it, they're making sure everything's done at the same time uh, so that it's all on the plate and it's all warm together. And like, if you're really excellent, you can do that. But then a robot can just do that every single time. Right, you there's only that in. there's only there's only only ten percent of the chefs in the world are top ten percent, right? Like by the definition, chefs so. like hey, you know, table three had like the shrimp, you know, messed up. Now you gotta cook an extra shrimp. That that throws off your schedule, right? Right. It's hard. And so and so I think if we can if we can start replacing this by robots, it's not just like a replacement for like the low end hamburger. It's actually it could be a replacement like. I think a nice, like the nicest meal I could imagine is made, like, like you, if you've seen like your regimes of sushi, like you see the, the precision there. In principle, there only a small number of humans are able to do that type yeah, of and thing. Yeah, basically Jiro spent like 30 years to become like a robot. Right. Like perfectly mimic the same, you know, 17 motions that he uses to like roll up the, the you know, the, the, the rice and the, and the fish, right? And I think it's beautiful that that, takes place but i think what would be even more incredible and what's going to happen is instead of jiro spending his life making sushi he'll, in the future someone like that will spend a, a lifetime developing a machine that makes it with the same degree of care because it's possible in principle right it's it's not it's completely reasonable to say that a robot can have more dexterity more precision can do more repetitive motions yeah. than a human ever could right like and yeah, i 100 agree like i think it's like you know, I think there's some obviously like delicate art, but it can be quantified, right? Like perhaps like the acidity of the rice, right? That's like something that, you know, for fine sushi, you want to have like the right vinegar in the rice. Well, you literally can have, you know, a robot arm that has like pH sensors to like have it precise perfectly every single time. The temperature, you have literally, temp you know, temperature sensors on the rice, on right. the fish. I yeah. think it's I think it's hubris to say that only humans are capable of certain things. It's like if you were looking at farming and you're like, no, the the, the farmer just knows the soil in right. his fingers and just knows the the weather and the senses. Like, would you rather have something that's completely modern, systematized, and understood? And I think I mean, just the world we live in is is the latter, something that's systematized and understood. And as we see more and more of that, we're going to see less of the uh, like, yeah yeah like the human. Uh, guesswork really yeah. it's like a heuristic yeah that reminds me of a company that my friend is running called Ac acuity agriculture you know john zang yeah he's building you know farming sensors that measure ph measure you know water levels so you don't need to i think you're already seeing that the farmers today are a lot less physical labor and a lot more intellectual already yeah they look like more like sensors they more look more like finance or computer science people just designing systems Taking bets, figuring out crop like, rotation, yep. figuring out, hey, like the cash flow on almonds is going to be better than the cash flow on hemp. Like, you know, my water levels are actually good. I got to calculate like drought levels and optimize water usage. So like the water is enough in this part of the field. I don't need to water it right. as often. So right? I think, I think again, it's like, think of like the finest craftsmen that we have today, the Giros of the world, the people designing perfect things and imagine them designing systems that can do what they do a thousand X. Yeah. I think that's honestly more beautiful right like why should only you know the 30 people that make a reservation 30 you know you know 30, 30 days in advance whatever six months in advance can only eat at Jiro every day if Jiro was able to make you know a thousand replicas you know machines that can replicate his art three thousand people can, can enjoy a sushi maybe the cost goes down by you know, right. an order of ten so do you think that people will still be going to imagine we are in that world so you have you can go to Jiro's robot restaurant right. where it's made like perfectly, maybe even better than what he can do himself. But then there's still Jiro's regular restaurant where it's him making it. Yeah. What do you think that people will still go to the one that's him, and why? Like what what's that? Yeah. No, I think that's a I think it's a funny question, right? Like we in this like future universe, our crystal balls are going right now, and you know as we've been talking, assume that human labor goes on to zero, and then all physical labor is automated and done by robots. 
And you enter this universe where I think that the most ostentatious, most opulent thing you can do is have human physical labor serve you. So I think that, you know, going to like a robot restaurant is like kind of like a fatter gimmick. And I think in a hundred years, going to a human created right. dinner will be like, oh, like, you, you, it's almost like kind of like a weird form of like slavery or servitude, right? Like you can imagine that like, hey, these people are like doing physical stuff. That's weird, like it's imprecise. So what's uniquely going on right now today is I think that we, we have more and more people who are dealing in systems and abstractions and like dealing with things that are not literally physically that they're holding, but they're looking at spreadsheets and presentations and stuff that's in the cloud. Rolling and fuzzy screens. Right. And right. so this is not just like our idea, like technology has always been cool. Like, like technology has always helped advance society. I think what's really, really special about right now is just there's literally a thousand times more people that are thinking about systems and abstractions than there ever were, than there were a hundred years ago. And so this is not just like our theory. It's like for every Jiro, there's a thousand people who can make a robot that's as good as Jiro. And that didn't happen a hundred years ago. You had like Henry Ford and like a small number of other people who could even like, who even had the luxury of being able to think about systems and abstractions and processes. And again, it, it all ties in because today you don't have to farm, you don't have to build your own house, you don't have to do these things. We're standing on all the progress that's happened today to date to where there's millions of people that don't have to farm, build their house, whatever, and they're able to deal in abstractions. And so they're able to then make the future even better. And so there's this exponential factor going on where, yep. we have, where the society we live in today was designed by like a small number of very smart intellectuals. And then today, there's just a much larger class of intellectuals. And so I think the rate of progress is going to go even faster. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a good, yeah, a good sort of closing the loop. Like, the, like sort of the install base is, is massive. So intellectual, the intellectual class is going to be everyone soon. Yeah, and I want to sort of tie like the, the notion of like, hey, this intellect, intellectual class is very small, you know, in history. And I think, you know, I always like tying things back to history. If you look at, you know, what people are remembered in history. It used to be like great conquerors, like, you know, like Genghis Khan is someone that we remember, or Julius Caesar, and they were known because they like physically dominated their environments. They had Roman legions or Mongol hordes, like literally taking over, destroying, like breaking down cities, you know, and, and physically dominating people. If you zoom, you know, more into modernity, you see artists starting to become remembered. You have, you know, Da Vinci. You have, you know, Newton. These, these, these thinkers are still not into, now being, you know, you know, their legacy is being remembered. And if you look at sort of modern history, like who in our current generation will be remembered? Will it be like the generals that are leading our armies in the, you know, in, in against ISIS, which, or will it be like? the intellectual businessmen who are really changing how we exist, right? If you look at Julius Caesar or, or Genghis Khan, they like physically change how people live because, hey, new culture, new law, new currency. Like, I think, you I don't, think, don't follow that, we kill you, right? I think the incentives are just different from society. Like the incentive is, it's much better to nurture the development of science, arts, technology, great thinkers, that that's a better end game. Like, winning some new land or some new territory from someone else on this like small planet that we have is not where like the 10x gains come from like the 10x gains gains come from new concepts new systems new ways of doing things whereas in the in the past like they're the way that you gained more power and yeah. and sphere of influence was with just more land more right. manpower more people reporting but now the way that a country succeeds is by more intellectual output yeah and then who are these leaders right like if you look at how we've communicated right like arguably you know email you know social media like twitter facebook snapchat yeah. instagram these are like our these products have billions of users. These are literally bigger than like most nation states. Yeah. These are like really changing and manipulating how we operate, right? Like, if I didn't have, I like my life is materially different before I had an, like before and after I had an iPhone. Before yeah. I'm able to text and like. Yeah, I think I think again it goes back to the point of why now is so special because if you look a hundred years ago, 
1850, like when half of Americans are still farmers, there were still people that were running businesses that were dealing in, in figuring out systems and processes at the high level, but it was such a small number of people because communication and, and the basic things that you would need to be running a system was so damn expensive that if you want to be like running systems, you, you're paying for telegraphs, it costs time, it costs money, you're paying for people to ride around on horseback. Like literally communication used to be expensive. Yeah. The idea of like, hey, I'm in Chicago and I'm coordinating something between LA and New York. It used to be most people couldn't do that like in their lifetimes. And now anyone can sit at a computer and like send an email and make that happen. Like, And that's why it's so what's going on today is so incredible is that a lot of people are able to think about symbolic systems. A lot of people are able to think about abstractions because the building blocks, the things that enable that, like communication, are just like free or cheap, whereas they used to be very expensive. Yeah, and I think that opens up, you know, to the last point that I we wanted to touch base on, which is this notion of meta tools. Yeah. Right? Inventions, products, uh, you know, methods of, 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 of producing value that increase productivity, right? So if you think about, um, which it was, which is why it's like personally very interesting and very exciting for us to be working in biohacking and nootropics, right? Like if you could create a tool or a system, potentially nootropics, smart drugs that help everyone in the world be 1% more productive. Yeah. Like the G G G GDP of the world uh, by the World Bank was $75 trillion. If you can increase world productivity by 1%, that's $750 billion. Right. That's literally like Apple plus Google market cap combined basically. Yeah. And you can do that every single year. That's a crazy amount of leverage. Yeah. I think that's what gets us excited. It gets me excited about like this notion of, hey, can we help push humanity a little bit more productive, a little bit smarter? Yeah. And I, I think, like, I think uh, going back to historical context, yeah, like what have been some of these like interesting meta tools and like, can we, you know, perhaps explore for the audience here? What are some of these future meta tools that can really these step functions well, I think of our I, society. I think one important future meta tool is going to be some of the things that extend life. Because right now you have you have your life is this kind of sandwich yeah. of your education is one piece of bread and then like your your later years retirement geriatric is the other piece of bread and in the middle is your your prime. Right. And as your life gets longer the part that extends is the prime. Like you're still going to take 20 years plus or minus to to, to be educated, like ramp up, you're still gonna have like some end of life time where you're, where you're less productive. But if people are regularly living to 120, 150, 200, then all of a sudden we're seeing significant gains in like the middle of your life, your prime of your life. Right. Yeah, and I wanna be clear. I think when people think about like longevity extension, it's not like you're, old, you're 80 <sighs> for 100 years. Like you want to not just increase your lifespan, but really your, what, what, you know, your yeah. health span, like the prime of your life. Right, and, and so as, as that type of meta tool comes into being, as people are living healthier, as people are taking action when they're in their teens and their 20s to build the foundations for a longer life, as people are understanding their own humans, their own human body as a system and able to optimize it and be more performant, have, have better insight into what they're doing, then those people are going to be contributing better and better to society like this increasing class like there's millions of people who are who can be considered intellectuals today if they're also living longer then we're just we're starting to see like crazy like you, compounding you, exponential you, effects you, you and i both know like like you're super people who are like 50 or 60 like who have been in in the game for a while like who have been working hard and like started out smart and also have 30 years of experience are incredible but they're also like thinking about retirement what if they weren't thinking about retirement for another 30 years what if they're like hey yeah I'm, I'm 50 i'm a spring chicken like let's keep I'm going still as aggressive as it was when i was 20. right that's that's insane right imagine if like you know i think putting it to like a like athletic analogy right what if michael jordan at, at 50 was as physically fit as when he was 25. right like going through 30 years of just like championship caliber performance like your mental game your technique is so strong apply that to like the business and intellectual world, right? Like if Einstein, he invent, you know, he created the notions of, you know, relativity in his like 20s and spent like a long period of life, like trying to figure out, you know, reconciling quantum, you know, di you know quantum you know, phenomenon with like the notion of, hey, God doesn't, you know, play with probability. God doesn't play dice, right? Right. What if he had like 50 more years on top of like all of his experience to compound and to keep, you know, thinking and, and, and researching? 
I think just for me personally, right? Like, what if we were able to, you know, have four PhDs right. in computer science, in, in biology, in, in manufacturing, and then, we're, and then we, we exit, you know, school at age 35, but we still have 30, 40 years of, like, prime productive thinking. Right. We're, that's, like, a crazy amount of leverage because I think it's, one, compounding effects and, like, Metcalf's law of like if more and more nodes in this network of people are even smarter right interchange of ideas because it's free and, and instantaneous you get this like crazy yeah. like feedback innovation loop that just yeah will just start taking off yeah and I, I think that when we're thinking about other meta tools like I, I think it cannot be understated how important these developments are going to be things like that have happened in the past like we talk about email or just digital communication in general yeah, yeah. Let's i like, think let's talk I think about like some of the, the, the classical classic, ones just yeah to help you know paint like the a picture for people here. like for instance like currency the advent of currency is an incredible metal meta tool where instead of trading like cows for grain you're trading cows for gold and then you're trading gold for grain and that enables a much more complex system in a lot of right? like commerce not everyone's haggling because you have, then you have like I can't carry cows with right. me everywhere to shop. I I can carry a piece of paper or a piece of gold. Right. It just there's way less friction. You the the sense of like supply and demand becomes more like more broad and more global or yeah. regional rather than like hey how, I need grain. All I have is cows. That's a very local like constraint. That's a very like micro economy as opposed to like hey in general how many cows and how much grain does society have and that should be a better way of setting the price so currency was these th was one of these things that had like the step function or like like the numbering system going being able to like do algebra and and, and like advanced uh, calculations on numbers it was like these are these are the types of things that like stepped society up significantly right. we talked about interchangeable parts like yeah you know a couple other examples that you know i think are you know really foundational are the, the 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 notion of the printing press right like even just writing in general right, right. You, you, before the notion of writing you had to pass on experience and knowledge through oral tradition and you know if you you know if your dad died early you know or you know your, your grandfather died early didn't pass along his experiences fighting in, in a war and learning how to you know do ambushes you lost, you know, his 30, 40, 50 years of, of warfare knowledge. Right. But if you write that down in The Art of War by Sun Tzu or, you know, write it down in Machiavelli, you know, Machiavelli's The Prince, now you can pass on, like, all of those observations, his knowledge, his theories onto the next generation. Right? So that the information gap is, or the information loss is, like, mitigated. Right. But if you look into the crystal ball for the future, what if you could just, like, transplant those memories and experiences Period. Right. What if I, I could just like upload like Machiavelli's experiences into my brain, where I could viscerally understand like, not yep. just his words, but like, ooh, I got screwed here. I mean, I think we're learning a lot of those like by running a company, right? By running Nutribox. Like, uh, there's so many little micro optimizations we have done differently. And and I think that I think that this is not science fiction. This is actually happening for two reasons. One is, one is that there's more people that are thinking about these types of things. And the second point, which is also very connected, is that there's a lot more people who are who can possibly like receive and use these things. It's the same set of people that are thinking about like these types of problems, these systemic problems, these new inventions, these step functions. Right. And there's a larger set of people that are like able to receive it. Yeah. One, one interesting thought experiment is like, what if you go back to 1850 and you and you give everyone email? It's still like most people are farming. Like they can't really right. use email for anything because like I gotta eat like I have to farm I have to milk the cows I have to plant the seeds I have to do these daily like routines like an install base of intellectuals right like just right, way the, smaller right like the provost of universities would have loved emails but like the 50% of people farming they wouldn't have gotten use out of it and obviously the analogy breaks down because eventually you have like if you have email in 1850 and everyone's you have internet, training farming techniques and people have it, figured it out it yeah. falls apart but like it, you take in 1995 when you have like a critical mass of people who are working at office jobs desk jobs and then you have and then email comes into vogue people can really use it and take advantage of it because the install base i love the, the i love the term install base the install base in 1995 of people who could benefit from email compared to 1850 is like 
thousands of times bigger. And I think the same thing is happening now. Like the install base for, for nootropics is bigger than even than it was 20 years ago and definitely 100, 150 years ago. Like if you're working in the field, it doesn't really matter like your short term memory or your rapid visual information processing. You're just doing some rote mechanical thing. You're better off having like a good, healthy, like amount of protein so you can be like lift heavy things and be strong yeah. right that's what matters but, yeah, then, good but, cow. <laughs> but but yeah but today <laughs> yeah, good ox yeah. but today it's like no if you can actually reliably get into a productive mind state and 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 be smart and be able to be like creative and sharp and like use these intellectual capacities of your mind then like then that's extremely beneficial and it's beneficial across a large install base of society. So we're gonna see more and more people that are trying to solve these types of problems, and we're gonna be see more and more people who are able to solve these types of problems as well. Yeah, I think when, in a thousand years, when we look back, the Julius Caesars of our generation will be like the Jobs, the Zuckerbergs, the people that are creating these intellect, these like tools, these things, and, and battling in the, in, in the intellect realm, not in the physical realm. These will be like the conquerors. Um, you know, I, th I think sets up a lot of evidence around, hey, this, this axiom of intellect, intellectual ability is the driving force. I, I think it's, it's, it's obvious given like the historical context and the trends and what we're observing. And it really just sets up the frame of like, of, of why we're here in, yeah. in the space of biohacking. I think right? we're, we're all smart guys. We can do anything in the world. And I think that the fact that like, hey, we're at a unique point in history where hey, we can add a lot of value to the world by helping everyone be yeah. a little bit better, a little bit more productive. I think optimizing the human intellect is more important now than it ever was before. There's yeah. just more people that can receive it and more that can do more net good for society than ever before. And it's, yeah, it's part of what yeah, makes me personally excited about what we're working on. Yeah, I think we covered a broad spectrum of historical trends and, and also had a, a chance to you know, play uh, farseer wanted to you know let's you know before we wrap up any other last thoughts i i one interesting factoid that we talked about a little bit before was the was that there's more science being produced now than ever before right right and i right. think that's an interesting just another kind of confirmation of this of this fact that we're seeing where it's literally more people are dealing with like the scientific method and like hy like hypothesis testing and and it's that's intellectual that's undeniably like an intellectual task cuz your food is taken care of. You don't have to build your house. Like we're, we're literally seeing, this is not just like us saying it. There's literally, if you have more scientists thinking about more scientific problems, what, like how cool is that for society? Like you, instead of at one Isaac Newton, like in 1800s, like there's now like a hundred of them alive. Right. Yeah, because they're not, the other 99 people back when Isaac Newton was alive, they had to freaking farm and now they don't have to freaking farm. So now we have a hundred of them. And they can all talk and share ideas. Yes. And get smarter together. Yeah, and they're probably, they they start, like, by age 20, they're as smart as Isaac Newton, or they're at least, you can be as familiar with, with like, like, the corpus of, you know, modern knowledge. Right, and and, and you're communicating, and, yeah, like, the, I think we're just seeing crazy scaling to where, like, I, I think one of, the, one of the limiting things is going to be, what can a human do? Like, yeah. how, like how much time can you spend doing like truly human tasks, truly intellectual things, creative things, systemic things, like how, how much time and how, how high quality is that time? Yeah, and I, I would say to you know, wrap it up nicely, yeah. and biohacking is you know, our approach to maximizing the humanness of our time. Yes. Be the best version of yourself, most productive version of yourself given the limited time we all have. Extend that amount of time that we all have. Right. Cool. Awesome. Thanks.